can we do when we are either aware that someone is a numerical token in a group or when we're aware that we ourselves are a numerical token in a group? I'm going to then talk a little bit about effective team building and then wrap up by talking about going forward with your goals and your intentions, particularly if you decide that this trajectory of STEM or engineering specifically is for you. Okay. So the bottom line is I want you to learn uh, and to listen, but also to engage in self-reflection and to walk out of today saying, oh, this is how I can apply this about a time when you were part of a group or you walked into a situation and you were the only person of a particular category when you entered that room, when you walked into that situation, okay? So for me, I'm a Chicana by heritage, I'm a Texan by birth, and I'm a social psychologist by training. And inevitably, I'm gonna walk into one or any other situation where I'm the only one of a particular category. Generally, within Quest, I'm the only psychologist, and I'm surrounded by engineers, okay? When I was going uh, through school, in particular with graduate school, but even as an undergraduate, there were many times when I walked into a class and I might have been the only woman or I might have been the only Latina in that set. But it doesn't have to be something that's visible. It can be something that you're aware of that makes you different from everybody else. So think about that for a moment. When you've experienced that, think about what it felt like for you and think about how it might have affected your performance or your interaction with other people. And for those of you who are afar, um, the young lady's name is Daniela, and she has been in a situation where she's the only girl in a group of uh, boys or men, gentlemen, uh, males, uh, in an engineering setting. And so the common approach of uh, the other members of the group was to tell her what to do, but she's actually quite independent and she used the term bossy, so it didn't work well, that particular situation. But it was clear that she was different. And because of that difference, she was being treated a certain way, and then she responded in a particular way. Anybody else? The only girl in an AP physics class, um, and having the guys who are present explain the information um, in a demeaning way, in a condescending way, whether they were aware of it or not, but clearly it created a, a problem. And there's a sense of isolation in that the boys probably came together and easily became comrades or friends, but the, the one female in the group might not have been as well. Okay, so both of these were on the basis of gender. Do we have anybody else who has felt different on a different dimension other than gender? Ironically, she's on there because they want to diversify the board, so they bring in an Hispanic or maybe you know some other my, members of other minority groups but then it's so isolating, okay? So it's clear if you're in that situation, you walk in and you think things like, I'm different, what do they think of me? How am I coming across? How am I being evaluated? Did I say that the right way? And so that's the type of uh, diversity that we're gonna talk about, is what happens when you're a numerical token. And a numerical token, or a token is the term I'll be using, is simply whenever you are one or one of very few in an otherwise homogeneous group. Okay, so you're the only one of a social category in a group where there's a great homogeneity of people who are not like you. And when we think about it in scientific terms, a token is really anybody who's represented to less to the point of less than 25% or less of their social category in that particular group. So code that one, 25% or less, and we see effects that are related to being a token. And I'll give is an instance of underrepresentation. You have one or very few individuals from a different social category, from others in a primarily homogeneous group. Related terms that we use in the field, in the field of social psychology, include solos, minority status, marginal, underrepresented minorities, URMs is the term that's typically used in engineering, and it's operationalized as 25% or less. Okay. When we think about engineering specifically, we know that there is vast underrepresentation.
Here's a slide that shows the bachelor's degrees awarded to women from the years 2005 to 2013. Okay. And there's a lag here. They create these reports that are based on national data, so they're always several years behind. But if you look at the percentage of women who earned engineering degrees in 2005, it was 19.5%. And you turn to eight years later, and it's 19.1%. Okay, so obviously that's less than 25%, correct? Okay, so women oftentimes have the experience of being a token when they're in the field of engineering. Now, I should also mention that some fields are actually far more diverse. So the subfields within engineering that are greater than 25% include some of the following, environmental, biomedical, chemical, biological, agricultural, and industrial manufacturing. So in these particular subfields, women actually have greater representation. But here we're still in the 30s, and here we're up into the 40s, and um, we don't have any fields of engineering where women are in the majority at this point. And of course, we have other traditional fields where their numbers are even smaller. So when you talk about aerospace, electrical, mechanical, computer, and mining, you can see that there's very few women. So the experience for women here will be much different. They're gonna walk into a classroom and they may be the only woman. They can walk into every single <coughs> classroom in a single semester and they are the sole representative of their gender. So it's a different experience. Now, does that mean you shouldn't go into engineering if you're female? No, absolutely not. What we wanna do is we wanna change these numbers so that they resemble these and then change these numbers so that they continue to increase the number of, or the proportion of women um, who are entering these fields. Here's the figures on PhD. These are doctoral degrees awarded and it pretty much is the same thing. Overall, their percentage is a little bit higher, 22%, but still less than 25%. Same fields show higher representation and similar fields as in the previous slide show lower representation. When we turn to ethnic racial groups, the proportions are even lower, okay? So you can see here's the bar from the earlier graph, 19.5% of women are getting degrees in engineering at the bachelor's level. But look at the different ethnic racial groups, and these combine men and women. So this is, would be Asian American males and females, Hispanic males and females, and all the way down. And although there's this sense that somehow Asians predominate in engineering, you can see that they only end up with 13% of the degrees. So that perception really is an overstatement. We need to increase all our numbers across all these ethnic racial groups. And you can see that Native Americans are very poorly represented as are Pacific Islanders. Now over time, these have actually been inching up, believe it or not, but, it's important for engineering, it's important for STEM broadly to have that level of diversity. Because what are some advantages of diversity and inclusion? Can you think of any? Do we want fields that are all comprised of one single social category? Or do we want to have fields that really are representative of the population? What do you think in the back? Absolutely. And what is your name? Sydney. Sydney. Okay. So Sydney says we need to get a diversity of ideas and products that are created. And that's absolutely right. If you're creating new technology, if you're creating new de devices, you're going to be far more successful if you actually know the audience that you're producing for. Okay. And so any technology that you use, whether it's computers, your cell phones, cars, how many of you use cars, computers, and cell phones? <laughs> okay, so to the extent that you're involved in designing these to make them convenient and uh, um, to allow to facilitate productivity and work, you need to be able to understand your audience. We're going to understand that audience better if the design team actually is comprised of members of that audience. And the audience is very broad. We're talking about global and national audiences. So it's really important for us to bring these numbers up in order to serve the greater good. And it's not just about designing for that audience, it's also about allowing for people who have the talent and the intelligence 
to be in fields that are high impact and high pain, just like engineering. Okay, so we want those opportunities available to you, and we want the field to represent the broader population so that what we produce actually facilitates the work, the progress, et cetera, of that broader <coughs> audience in a well-informed way. Um, on the faculty, underrepresentation is also an issue. So when we talk about professors in engineering, only 15% of those professors are women. 25% are Asian, 3.9% are Hispanic, 2.5% are Af um, African American. And you see in this slide quite conspicuously, the bar for Native Americans is missing. And that's because they don't even register. Their numbers are so small on our faculty ranks that they don't even account for a board. So again, this is something that we want to remedy. Now, why do you think it might be important for faculty to be diverse? What difference does it make if the people who teach you reflect a diversity of ethnic racial groups as well as gender? Would you be more comfortable asking questions and stuff? Yeah, well, first of all, it allows you to see somebody up there who looks like you and you make you more comfortable asking questions. You may find it easier to approach them and say, can I work in your research lab? Um, you may feel like they're going to treat you more fairly, but more importantly than that, you get to learn from the different perspectives. Okay? How many of you have had diverse teachers in your past? Hopefully most of you. In, in elementary or middle or high school, is there anybody who's had no diversity across those levels? Okay. Hopefully you have. It's, it's important to learn from people who have different perspectives and ideas and who have different approaches and who can be role models for different people. Okay, so just to recap, pay attention to this slide here. Uh, the negative consequences of numerical distinctiveness of being a token or having token situations are as follows. First of all, if you have very little diversity, it means that a wide swath of the population is being excluded from the benefits of a high impact high paying, really nourishing, soul nourishing and challenging career, something that you want to do. So we don't want to do that. On the flip side, from the perspective of the academy or the workplace, why should we want to restrict the entering talent pool? Anybody who's capable of discovery, anybody who's capable of thinking, anybody who's capable of inventing, of generating ideas, or even generating questions should be at the table. So we want to have the best talent pool possible. And if we're excluding women, if we're excluding minorities, if we're excluding first generation or low income people, we're not doing what we need to be doing. As a nation, we want to continue to be competitive. We've lost ground in recent decades and we need to be able to think globally in terms of marketing, in terms of sales, in terms of discovery, in terms of innovation. And the only way we do that is by encouraging all talent to come to the table. And then finally, at an individual level, we had a couple of individuals volunteer what the experience was like for them when they were a token. And I can vouch for that, I've been a token so many different times, that token status actually can lead to a reduction or diminution of your own outcomes, of your own performance in a group. Does anybody know why this would happen? Why you would perform more poorly than your actual capacity simply because you're a token? Any guesses? Yes. You feel intimidated? Yes. What is your name? Joelle. Joelle? Okay, thank you. Yes, you may feel intimidated. So you may know the answer, but you don't feel comfortable speaking up. What else? What else might interfere with your performance if you're a token? Yes. Perception. Perceptions. Yeah. Oh, elaborate a little bit. Perceptions of you. Okay. So you might not get the opportunity to speak up or okay. participate. All right. And what is your name? Lauren. Lauren. Okay. Absolutely. Perceptions that other have others have of you may actually constrain you. We had Miss Bossy here 
who was treated as if <laughs> she wouldn't, uh, she needed to get direction, but in fact she did not. She was a take charge person. But those perceptions over time, if they keep being communicated and conveyed to you, will affect how you respond. Okay? Um, similarly, people may think that they have to speak down to you, as you mentioned earlier. So people are treating you differently. And over time, you may just give up. But in addition to that, there's something very basic, and it's called a divided attention. And so as a token, because you feel so different and distinctive, you are sitting there thinking thoughts like, I'm different. How did I come across? Did I say that right? How are they going to evaluate me? And you know, your mind is occupied with those kinds of thoughts. And what happens to the thought and attention that should be directed to the task at hand? It goes down. We have limited amounts of attention. So as attention to self-presentation goes up, attention to the task goes down. And so if you're a token, it's very easy to fall into the trap. Now, I will also say there are a couple of advantages of being a token, but I'm not going to get to those till the end, so we'll save those for later. For the most part, the literature has shown that token status is problematic. All right, so here are some examples. This is real science. In this, this, these studies, which were mostly conducted in my laboratory, published as well, we created groups of four people. And the four people either were all the same, like they were all male, all female, all from the same school, all Latinos, all Caucasians. Or the four groups were made of three people who were the same and one person who was different. Okay? So a non-token male group would be made up of four males, right? But what would a token male group look like? A token male. What, what do you think that configuration would be? Three females, one male. That's right. And then for females, a non-token female group would be four females. And then a token female group would be you have one token female with three males. And the same thing with Hispanics and Caucasians and people who go to this school or that school. So you've got that rank, okay? And so we had them do a number of tasks while they were members of the group. For example, in one study, we had them exchange opinions on all sorts of topics. What's your favorite ice cream? Who's your favorite author? What's your favorite tree? Just on and on and on. And they were in this group and they exchanged this information with all the group members. And afterwards, they were given a surprise memory test. Don't you just hate those pop quizzes? <laughs> at any rate, when they were given the memory test, we looked at how much they remembered, not just of their own responses, but the responses of the other people. On average, non-tokens had a pretty good memory. They remembered 85% of the content. So in school, that would translate into a B, right? Which is good. Tokens, however, only remembered 66%. What does that translate into, grade ones? D, yeah. So can you imagine being in a non-token versus a token group? You're the exact same person. But when everybody is like you, look at how you're performing. And when you're the one who's different, you drop down. And these studies are really clever because we want to rule out that you're being treated different by the other people or that they're conveying certain perceptions of you or being mean to you or discriminating in any way. And so what we actually do is we have four cubicles and each cubicle has a camera, a monitor, a microphone, and a speaker. And so a person is alone in the room and they see on the TV whoever is speaking in the group. So they're told there's three others just like you. And when it's your turn to speak, you'll see yourself on cam on the monitor and everybody else will too. And when it's person one's turn to speak, you'll see them and hear them. Person two, you'll see them and hear them. Person three, you'll, and so you'll go like, around like that. But in reality, there's ever only one real person present and that's the participant. And what we've done is we've created a videotape of the other three people. So we play the videotape on their screen and they think these are people taking turns that are present, but they're not. And then when it's their turn, we turn their camera to live and they see themselves and they believe everybody else is watching them too in these other rooms. But what this does is it controls for the behavior of the other three people. And we can use the exact same three people for the token and the non-token condition. So we might have a videotape of three females and when the participant is a female, a non-token, that's what she watches. But when this participant is a male, they watch that videotape, they think it's live, and they think they're interacting with three females, but now he's a token and he feels distinctive. But there's no way they can be treated differently. 
And we're very creative as social psychologists. So we go into the next room next to the participants and we pretend to talk to these other fake people. So we muffle our voices and it sounds like there's voices going on next door. And then we'll rattle a chair and they hear sound. And then I come into their room and I talk to them supposedly tell them exactly what I told this other person, this other person, and this other person. So it's a lot of fun because you create a situation in a matter of minutes and they think it's real. And so when we tell them afterwards, well, those people weren't really there because we do debrief them fully, they are in shock and in awe and they say, can I go see? And I go, yeah, come look, there's an empty room. There's nobody there. Okay. But doing so allows us to have strict control over the circumstances. And we know that the only thing that's different is that they know in their mind that they're a token. Okay. So here's a study on memory. Here's a study on problem solving. Here we just gave them anagrams. Those are when you take a word, you mix up the letters, and then they have to solve those anagrams. And if you're a non-token, you solve them at 90%. But if you're a token, your performance goes down to 65 what do you think of this difference in performance? Is it hard to believe? Do you think you've been there? Did you know it was this dramatic? Anybody have any comments? Yes, it, or It kind of reminds me of some research in education that um, like at the middle school level, girls tend to do perform better in math. Um, classes when they are in classes. Okay. Yes, there is a lot of work in education, in math in particular. When you have all girl classes, they learn better, they do better. And that's because when they're in a mixed class, even though they may not be token, there's all sorts of stereotypes and beliefs and maybe even comments being made by the male students and maybe even the teacher. And so it's the same situation. Here you're a token, you think, what are they thinking of me? And you assume the worst. Now, I have to say, in real situations, tokens can be treated poorly and negatively, and often are, okay? Or they're shut down, or their ideas are dismissed. So what we're doing here is looking at the purest form of token status, but in the real world, all those other factors kick in. So you've got to ask, if in fact this disparity happens when you're not being treated differently, imagine what it's like when you compound it with that differential treatment, with that negative treatment that to tokens are often subjected. Uh, here's one more. This was a task on social creativity. And I have non-integrated here for a reason, but I'll explain it later. Here, the, all the group participants were given um, social dilemmas to solve. And this is social dilemmas are when you have two parties that are at odds with one another, and you have to figure out what the best solution is. So a typical one would be in a work setting, you're the manager, you have six people that report to you, and you have a board of directors that you report to. The board of directors have hired a consultant. The consultant tells the board, well, you know, right now you have these six employees at, in each unit, and these six employees are rotating along six different workstations. So they do six different tasks, and they move around. But the consultant says, if you kept the employees at a single station apiece, they would become very expert at that particular subtask and they would produce faster and you would produce more widgets and your profits would go up. So the consultant says to the board, tell your manager that he needs to put, he or she needs to put them all in a single station. But as a manager, you know that employees like to rotate because it reduces boredom and it allows them to learn different tasks throughout the process. Okay. And so you're told, as a manager, what do you do in this situation? Do you please the employees and keep them in rotation? Or do you please the board and make everybody stuck in one place? Okay. And so as a participant in a study, you would be given a dilemma like this. You would be told, play the role of the manager and come up with a solution for this conflict, for this you know, differential um, disparate goal situation because the employees have one goal, the board has another goal. So if you were in that situation, you came into a study, you were told to solve problems like that one, what would your solution be to that particular situation, that work situation? Would you follow the board? Would you please your employees? 
Show of hands, how many of you would please the board? Oh, okay. A couple. Those are the only two possibilities. Well, right now they are, okay. okay. Uh, how many of you would choose to keep the employees happy? All right, and what would the rest of you do? Any other choices? Quit. Quit. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. So those are the typical choices that people come up with. And so when you choose one or the other, these binary choices, it's called non-integrated thinking because you're choosing one or you're choosing the other. Okay. So, but the question is, across these different dilemmas, there were many different choices and they could come up with as many as they could. That was the task. So if you were a non-token, the average number of choices that you came up with across the different problems was 155. But if you were a token, you generated fewer of these binary solutions. So this task, this slide is here because it shows us that there's a general pattern. If you're in a token situation, you're at a disadvantage. Your performance is lower than what it normally would be. And I have to tell you, for most of these, we have baseline measures. Before they're told they're going to be in a group, we measure their memory. We measure their problem-solving skill. We measure their ability to come up with solutions. And when you compare tokens and non-tokens before they're in the group on these different measures, they look identical. So they have the same ability level to begin, but something awful happens once they join the group and they realize they're a token then all of a sudden there's some paralysis, there's some questioning, there's some self-doubt, and there's lowered performance. Okay. So this is not good, right? And this should argue for us then to get rid of token status, to create more equitable settings where you have representation rather than under-representation of self. All right, so let me continue. What causes token status? This is another pay attention to slide. And I'm just recapping what we said earlier. Sometimes it's this because we're concerned with evaluation. So because we're so worried about how we're being evaluated, then we don't perform. This makes us focus internally on these self-presentational thoughts. And so our attention is in here rather than on the task. And anytime you divide attention, performance is going to go down. In essence, we get distracted from the central task because we're busy thinking of other things. It's kind of like me when I go to a lecture or when I go to church or when I go to anywhere where there's a big audience, I have to sit in the front. This has nothing to do with token status, but you'll see the, the parallels. And I sit in the front because I have a tendency to be a little bit ADHD. So if I sit in the middle or the back, my mind is looking at the ceiling, I'm seeing who's walking in, I'm paying attention to the, a bird that got in the room. And so my mind is wandering, and am I listening to what's being said? No, and I miss half of it, okay? So anytime we get distracted, whether it's because of ADHD or whether it's because of token status, we don't pay attention and we don't learn. And then when I walk out of the room, what did they say? Oh, I forgot that one. Okay. So it's a similar thing. And so what ends up happening is that the performance that you're able to give is lower than what you're actually capable of. I'm a really smart person. I have a PhD, got my degree from Princeton University, one of the premier universities in the world, actually. But I can go into a lecture and then walk out totally ignorant because I've sat in the middle or I've sat in the back. Okay? It doesn't reflect my capacity. It reflects the fact that I was distracted. And the same thing happens with token status. Over time, what we've learned is that you, if you find yourself performing more poorly that you know, than you know you're capable of, this creates stress for you. And in time, it reduces your well-being. And so we have another study, I don't think I've that slide here, where we looked at employees at, on ASU's campus. We looked at faculty, classified staff, administrators, and academic professionals. We asked them to report the number of people in their work unit, in their department, that shared their gender as well as their ethnic racial group identity. Then we asked them to do a stress checklist and a health problems checklist. And what we found is for those people who were token-like, that means there were 25% or fewer of their social category in their department, they reported at higher levels of stress, and they also reported a greater number of health problems over an 18-month period. 
So this is real stuff. It's not just that you missed the content in this particular session. It's that you missed the content or you perform more poorly over a series of tasks, over a series of months, over a series of years, and you know in your mind that you can do better. So it begins to stress you out and worry. And high stress leads to health problems over time. So token status is a high impact, important phenomenon. What can we do? Do we have to succumb to token status? No, I managed to get my degree, I managed to get a job, I managed to publish, so I do really well. So just because you're a token doesn't mean you're gonna do poorly. It's just that you have to be aware of what it can create in order to counter those negative consequences. So here's some interventions that I would recommend. First of all, if you are in charge of the group, then change the numbers. Bring in more women, bring in more ethnic racial diversity, bring in religious diversity, bring in sexual orientation diversity, bring in income diversity. To the extent that you have representation, you really do get more perspective. People learn to work with one another. You produce more creatively, there's greater innovation. If you're not in charge of the overall numbers of a class or a work setting or a job, et cetera, then what you can do is create smaller work groups within that. So form teams, teams of two people, teams of three, teams of four. And that way, it's not as intimidating. Even if there is difference, you're able to relate one-on-one. -on -one. So if you're a member of the Jewish board, Federation board, create committees or work groups where you're not one out of 350, but there's three different people who are different, or at least you're one out of four rather than that larger number. Okay? If you happen to be assigned to a group where you have to work with somebody who's of a different gender than you, then up front say, okay, why don't we form teams or this is the role that I'm gonna take. So be a little bit assertive then, okay? Don't focus on this vast differentness from yourself. Focus your attention um, by telling yourself, just telling yourself, oh gosh, I'm a numerical token. Or, oh my gosh, that woman is a numerical token. I better go say hello to her and have be her ally. Or, I don't want to be alone in this, so let me find somebody to connect with. And that way I don't feel different. So refocus your own attention. Tell yourself, I'm a token, this is what's likely to happen, but I'm gonna counter it, okay? Team building exercises are wonderful. So whatever you can do to create interest groups, shared interests, to say we're similar on this way, let's do a team building exercise, whether it has to do with a job or whether it has to do with fun, let's do a puzzle together, let's go to the puzzle room, whatever it is, build a team spirit because that way the difference can still be recognized, but it's not a negative thing, it's not stigmatized. And then finally, what we've done in the laboratory, because all of these are based on laboratory studies, what we've done is we've often created groups where we put the token in a position of power. And it doesn't mean that they boss everybody around, but for example, in one study, we said to the token before they were put into the group, we want you to give us your impressions of the other members of this group. So you're going to be the evaluator for this group. And sometimes we said the other people know you're the evaluator. And sometimes we said they don't know you're the evaluator. And these others, of course, are these videotaped confederates, but the person doesn't know. And so we said to them, so what we want you to do is listen to what they're saying, form impressions of us, and afterwards you'll tell us what your impression of them was. And what this did was, first of all, it gave them a special role, but secondarily, it turned the table. Rather than they being worried about how they were being evaluated by everybody else, they knew it was their task to form impressions of the other people, so it focused them outwards and they evaluated them. So there's nothing to stop you from evaluating others. You walk into a room and you say, okay, let me form an impression of this person and that person and that person. It focuses you outward. If you happen to be a teacher or in a situation where you bring information to the group as a whole, remember to recognize and value the contributions of members of groups from different backgrounds. Okay. So even when you're teaching science, even when you're teaching math, you can introduce the work by scholars who represent diverse backgrounds or the examples that you generate 
can include the names of people who are from different ethnic cultures, different racial groups, or they can be names of women as well as men. Okay. Otherwise, people assume that whenever you just use a last name, that that name generally belongs to a white male, and it doesn't. Okay. So just be diverse in the way that you address the content of whatever's being taught. Be sure to include diversity that way too. And like we're doing, create interest in young minds who reflect different sectors of the population. Because the only way we're going to change those PhD and those bachelor's degrees and those faculty numbers is by introducing kids early to engineering and the concepts of engineering. Because then you can learn about technology and discovery and innovation and how the sun can be used, et cetera, et cetera. And I think all kids naturally would be drawn to that. It's as you get higher up, you realize, oh, people like me aren't in this profession. They aren't in this. But whenever you get the opportunity to do outreach through your next generation or the younger generation, do so. Because that's how we grow diversity in the future. Okay. So, oh, I, did I go backwards? Oh, no, no. I'm going back to the, remember this, the social creativity thing? That was the work situation where you're put in the position of manager and you choose one or the other. So let's see those hands again. Who decided that you were going to please the employees? Okay, quite a few of you. Most of you have been employees in the past, I suppose, so it's important for you to know that perspective, okay? How many of you said you would please the board of directors and create more profit? Okay, a few of you, pragmatic, all right. So here's the deal with that particular exercise. So people can either generate binary solutions. I'll go with this side or I'll go with this side. Or people can create what we call an integrated solution where you take into account both perspectives and you come up with something that helps meet the needs of both ends. So think about that for a minute. What would it be like to have an integrated solution in this particular example? Different from I go with the board or I go with the employees. What would an integrated solution look like then? I'll give you a prize if you come up with an integrated solution. But I should warn you, it's only a quarter. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not the amount that counts, it's the recognition. So think about that dilemma, that social dilemma. You can go this way or you can go this way. But is there somewhere in the middle that might work better? Yes? Uh, find each individual's favorite station <coughs> and add some enjoyment to it in some way, give them some freedom which would then increase productivity. Okay. So one thing you could give the employees the choice of which station to use and then add something that gives them a sense of freedom. So that's getting towards integration. Yes? Put them in pairs. They each have one specific job, but pair them together so they're working with somebody. Okay. So they're working alongside somebody, but they each have the same station? I mean, they have one station each? They have six stations. Right them in groups, three groups of two. Right. So they're all doing the same thing, but they're next to each other, so they're not bored on the brinks. Okay, so to reduce boredom, co-locate them in teams so that they have company. Okay, so that's another potentially integrated solution that's not just keep as it is, you know, changing. I'm looking for one more. Let's see. Yes? I would specialize in a certain, like, um, field, and then have to go to another base and have to Okay, so they don't do a full rotation. They do their normal thing, but they do have the option to do the other thing. Okay, so these are all good. So integrated solutions actually are known to work better than non-integrated solutions when you have a social dilemma. Because what you end up doing is addressing the needs of both sides and trying to create a compromise. And in fact, the ideal integrated solution in that particular scenario is the following. You allow people to rotate, but now they only rotate on two 
or possibly three stations. So their expertise still goes up, but they're not stretched across all six, but their expertise goes up and the boredom still stays down because they're not limited to that one station, okay? So that is considered an integrated solution. And integrated solutions in the real world are far better, where you're, whether you're doing peace negotiations, whether you're doing employee assignments, whether you're doing uh, committee work, Anytime you're able to bring together different perspectives and come up with a synthesis that allows you to address both sides of the picture, people give greater buy-in, they're, they're seen as more positive things. So it turns out that tokens have an advantage over non-tokens when it comes to generating integrated solutions. And the reason is as follows. Remember those tokens are worried, thinking about what are they thinking of me? How am I doing? How am I coming across? What are they gonna say about me? Well, that means that they're engaged in perspective taking. When you're a token, you're sitting there worried about how others are viewing you. But that translates into you take, you, you take a step and put yourself in other people's shoes and now you're wondering how they're seeing you. That's what it means to be self-presentationally concerned. You're worried about how others are viewing you. Well, in doing so, what you're doing is engaging in perspective taking. Have I lost anybody? Okay. So again, when you're a token, you're sitting there thinking, what are they thinking of me? How am I coming across? And that's the same thing as saying you're putting yourself in the shoes of the other group members looking back at you and evaluating. That perspective taking ability, that capacity, that task is the same thing that's required when you move from non-integrated to integrated thinking because you're taking the perspective of the employees and you're taking the perspective of the board. And that that's the same process that's involved when you're taking your own perspective. Wow, did I say that right? Should I have speak, spoken up, blah, blah, blah? And when you're taking, how are they seeing me? This is how I'm seeing you, okay? So you're able to take perspectives readily when you're a token. So let's look at what happens when we measure integrated <coughs> social creativity. So that's this, integrate. These are the high complexity, complexity, high quality solutions. Non-tokens are generating 96 of these. And tokens are generating 184, almost double, right? Okay, so you can see the pattern here is the tokens always do less on these types of tasks. We call them linear tasks. But on these non-linear, high complexity, high quality tasks, tokens are actually doing that. All right, so what is the bottom line here? We already said there's all these negative consequences associated with token steps. But it's not all negative. Okay? Like anything else, there's a positive and a negative. And what we've come to learn is that tokens are really good at considering other people's perspectives in addition to their own. So if you find yourself as a token, take advantage of them. Understand that you have better perspective taking capacities than the majority members in your group. Now that doesn't mean you lord it in their face and you say, ha, I'm better at perspective taking no matter what you say. No, it just means that you navigate that particular setting, the particular set of tasks at hand, and you navigate how you interact based on knowing that you're, you have a broader vision. You're able to hold multiple balls, you know, juggling better than our people who are not on tokens. By the same, um, I was gonna say by the same token, okay. but that would be, <laughs> by the same measure, what it also means is that if you happen to find yourself in a situation where you recognize there's a token person, then understand that their perspective has some value to add. So be sure to reach out to them and ask those folks, what do you think? What is your perspective? Because they may have some creativity, some innovation, some quality decision making, some consideration and thoughtfulness that other people may not have. All right. So 
I still want you to know that tokenism generally produces negative consequences and for the field, it limits how we recruit talent and how we create talent and launch it forward. So we want greater representation. But even before we get there, we also need to understand that there's value when we bring diversity, even if there's only one person, to the extent that we welcome that diversity and we give that person from a diverse background the opportunity to speak up and to make a contribution. We don't want to pigeonhole them and treat them as if they know less or if they need direction, but give them that opportunity to show their talent. Questions? Can I take your PowerPoint off? Oh, so I, I may have one more slide. Let me see. Let me see. All right. So these are the questions for today. I'm going to give you a sheet. Everybody knows what a token is. Does anybody have any more information, more a need for more information? So I can call on any of you and tell me what percentage reflects underrepresentation to the point of token status. Okay. All of you know how token status affects you if you're the token. And you know at least one or two ways on how you can reduce those token deficits. And what can you do if you find yourself in a situation like this, or if you know of somebody else is a token? And now you can take one. <laughs> All right, so thank you very much. Any questions? All right. If there are no questions, I'm going to pass out a sheet that I want you to fill out. You don't have to put complete sentences or long essays. Just give me your impressions. I need your name and your role. Maria. And um, can you hear me? A brief I'm going to email you this. Thanks. And we're okay on time. Right? Yep, it's 9:27. I don't think you and I'm doing this today. You want to take over the chairs All right, guys. Thanks for joining us. Yes, please, one more.